I'm going to introduce uh, Lynn Connolly. So Dr. Connolly uh, came uh, first get her medical degree at N uh, New York University, and then she went to Stanford where she did her res uh, internal medicine residency before coming down here uh, for fellowship in digestive diseases. While she was doing her fellowship, she got a master's in clinical research in the biomathematics department. Um, and during fellowship, she also did research on brain signaling involved in obesity and uh, food addiction. Uh, she and I did, were chief fellows for one year, and I was, it was a pleasure to work with her, and, and it's a pleasure to have her as a colleague. She now practices uh, out in the Santa Monica location, um, and she'll be speaking to us today about functional gastrointestinal disorders. Lynn? Thank you, Kevin. So let's start today with some audience participation. Raise your hand if you've seen one of these GI symptoms in the last couple weeks. <laughs> so have I. <laughs> Uh, the first question you probably ask yourself when you see one of these patients is, is this a structural problem or is this a functional problem? And today, I have the pleasure of talking to you about two of the more common functional GI disorders, irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia. Of note, I've chosen to avoid the traditional dichotomy of saying organic and functional because we now know that there is a biochemical basis for all of these disorders. So why did all of you raise your hands? Because we see this all the time. This is a very common chief complaint, both in the primary care physician environment as well as GI uh, subspecialty clinics. They are also associated with a huge uh, impairment in health-related quality of life for our patients. The second question you probably ask yourself is, when should I or when can I call GI to help me? The short answer is whenever you want. I find that these patients are some of the more challenging patients that I see in my office, and I don't think any of us expect primary care physicians to handle these patients on their own. That said, certainly if your patients have any of these alarm symptoms or they're over the age of 50 and they're, it's the first time they're complaining of one of these symptoms, definitely give one of us a call because there's going to need to be more evaluation, including likely an endoscopy. Irritable bowel syndrome. So patients who have irritable bowel syndrome present with crampy abdominal pain that's recurrent or chronic that's associated with altered bowel habits. So remember that. Altered bowel habits are important. If your patient's abdominal pain is not related to altered bowel habits, your patient does not have IBS. All the functional GI is not IBS. Functional dyspepsia is when your patient presents with epigastric pain, discomfort, nausea, fullness, and there's no evidence of a structural etiology. The Rome 3 criteria is what many of us use to diagnose this. This is not a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't have to run every single test and make a diagnosis. But that said, you should be aware that the Rome criteria do have a limited diagnostic accuracy for distinguishing functional from structural etiology. So if you have a high risk of suspicion of something else, don't ignore that. Women in the US and Europe are more likely to have IBS than men, and I'm sure you all see that. But that's not the case everywhere in the world. In South Asia, South America, and in Africa, women and men have similar incidences. And in India, for some reason, men are more likely to have IBS than women. In the US, women are more likely to complain of more severe symptoms. They also are more likely to complain that their IBS impacts their daily life, and they have lower health-related quality of life because of their IBS. There are three subtypes of IBS, constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, and mixed IBS, and you probably all know that. But what's important to remember is that this subtype classification is determined by stool form and not stool frequency. So what I mean is if you have a patient that comes in and they say, I only have a bowel movement every two to three days, but every bowel movement that I have is watery and there's no solid pieces, a Bristol stool scale type seven, that patient still has IBS diarrhea predominant even though they're only having a bowel movement every couple days. And that's important when approaching treatment. IBS can present in many different ways. Usually your patients are going to complain of, again, abdominal discomfort, pain, cramping that's exacerbated by PO intake. A lot of patients have food sensitivities or food triggers. Anxiety and stress can often be triggers. 
And with women, it's important to ask if there is a correlation between altered bowel habits and their menstrual cycle. A lot of times women may not volunteer this, but their altered bowel habits can start before their menses. And again, when anticipating how you're going to treat these patients, um, that's important to know. IBS is not just a GI condition. In fact, about half the costs that are incurred, as well as about half the follow-up visits for patients with IBS are for non-GI symptoms, and that's what I want to emphasize today. IBS is associated with chronic pain syndromes. A lot of your patients are going to have fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, TMJ, chronic pelvic pain. IBS has also been linked to depression, anxiety, chronic fatigue, and sleep disturbances. And if I could emphasize one thing today, one take home point, it would be that. Patients who have IBS who are only being treated for their GI symptoms are going to be very unhappy and untreated. So as primary care physicians and nurse practitioners, you're in a very unique situation to both address these extraintestinal manifestations and at least start to approach treatment for these as well for their overall IBS treatment plan. We are still learning a lot about what causes IBS, and there's a lot of discussion and debate in the IBS community as to what the underlying pathophysiology is. That said, a unifying theme that most people agree on is that there's a dysregulation between the brain and the gut that manifests as visceral hypersensitivity. This is a, a pretty difficult uh, concept, I find, to explain both to myself and also to my patients. So I usually start by reminding them that if anybody, a patient who doesn't have IBS, were to sit down and eat a 5,000-calorie dinner, they'd probably feel pretty bloated, uncomfortable, crampy, and probably have some altered bowel habits. That's a normal response to that type of food load, intestinal distension, and gastric, uh, intestinal bloating and gas production. So what happens with visceral, peripheral hypersensitivity is that you have a decreased threshold for those nerves to fire. So intestinal distension and gas production that somebody without hypersensitivity may not feel, somebody with visceral hypersensitivity is feeling. Hypersensitivity is not just peripheral, but it's also central. So patients have a lower threshold for sensing that distension centrally, and they also have a decreased uh, threshold for responding to that afferent input. The rest of the items on this list are still uh, debated, and most people feel that IBS is likely a combination of factors. There's a lot of evidence now for the role of altered microbiota in irritable bowel syndrome, and this makes intuitive sense. We know that a lot of our patients improve if we give them probiotics, antibiotics, or diets that change the gut flora. Um, we also know that uh, gut microbiota are play a role in gastrointestinal motility and secretion. And there's new evidence that there may be some low-grade inflammation and altered immune re reactivity in these patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And the evidence for this is especially strong in the post-infectious IBS community. Early adverse life events, such as a sexual abuse, a divorce of a parent, um, being bullied at school. We know, especially in the primary care setting, that early adverse life events have been linked with many chronic conditions, and IBS is one of them. The mechanism it's thought for these long-term events of one early life event is felt to be related to epigenetic uh, programming, such as DNA uh, methylation. So if we were to do a poll, apparently, of all of the non-IBS experts, 70% of the non-IBS experts would say that IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion. And again, I want to emphasize today that that is not the case. And usually, if you start running a bunch of tests on these patients, they're going to feel that they have something wrong with them. And when you tell them that their tests are all normal, they're going to feel that you have no idea what's wrong with them. So if your patient is under the age of 50 and does not have any alarm symptoms and you feel comfortable with the Rome criteria that they have IBS, you do not need to do any additional testing. 
Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that everybody in Southern California either has celiac disease or is asking about if they have celiac disease. So one thing to uh, be aware of is that cost-effectiveness studies have shown that in your non-constipated IBS patients, it is cost-effective to screen for celiac disease if the prevalence of celiac disease is greater than 1%, which it is in the U.S. And for those of you who are studying for boards, that tends to be the one popular question on IBS. So IBS is uh, pretty easy to diagnose. It's very difficult to treat. It is very important that you have a good patient-physician relationship. And I start by telling patients that, because I think if you don't have that relationship, the treatment is really not going to go anywhere. It's also important to establish reasonable expectations. It may seem intuitive to us, but you often need to remind patients that if they've had 10 years of abdominal pain and food sensitivities, they're not going to be fixed in one or two or three visits. And for some reason, patients seem to hope that that's the case. There's a lot that we can do both in the primary care setting as well as the GI setting that do not involve medicines. And that's also important to note because a lot of your patients don't want to take medicines. And even the ones that do, they don't usually want to feel that the doctor is just reflexively giving everybody medicines because they have this diagnosis. So I usually start the conversation with some of the non-medicine options for treating IBS. Nancy uh, Jaffe, who's our dietitian nutritionist, is going to be discussing a lot of the dietary options. But just quickly, in the primary care setting, trials of avoiding dairy, high-fat foods, raw fruits and vegetables, and caffeines could be something that you may want to try. There's more evidence now that physical activity, probiotics, acupuncture, mindfulness meditation, and cognitive behavioral therapy have also improved global IBS symptoms. That said, many of your patients are going to need medicines. This is a pack slide that I broke down by predominant symptom. Patients with constipation. Many patients are going to try fiber, and they're going to say, I get gas and bloating. I can't take it. I usually then recommend an osmotic laxative like Miralax. The problem with Miralax is that your patients have to take it every day. They often like that immediate response that they get with the stimulant laxative, and they can also buy that in the herbal aisle, which they love. But the problem with that is that it also causes Senna cascara. It causes abdominal cramping and bloating. So be very careful with your patients who like that option. For the diarrhea predominant patients, some patients, um, they are afraid to give a lecture or come to a lecture because they're afraid they're going to have an attack of diarrhea. Use Imodium, Lamodal, some type of anti-diarrheal. Your patients are probably going to feel that this is a Band-Aid, so you really have to emphasize the other treatments that you're doing to address the diarrhea component of their IBS. Antibiotics have been used uh, with some success with improving global IBS symptoms and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And Elosichpon, be aware, is still available for women with severe IBSD under a very restricted program. Antispasmodics. I find that this is helpful for the patient who likes that pill in the pocket. So again, a patient who's afraid to go to their college test because they're afraid they're going to get this attack of abdominal pain, just knowing that they have a Levsin or a Bentil in their pocket that they can take is very helpful and reassuring. For your patients who have severe daily symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, a central acting agent is often very helpful. Usually, though, you have to build that relationship, though, with them before they're willing to try that. Um, tricyclic antidepressants decrease that visceral hypersensitivity I spoke to you about, but they can cause constipation, which is great in your IBSD people, but not so great in your IBSC. Um, as primary care physicians, you may be more uh, comfortable with SSRIs and SNRIs, and I encourage you to think about those, especially in your patients who have anxiety or depression, because this can kind of um, work for both. Uh, shifting to our second and last uh, functional GI uh, talk, so I don't have 20 minutes, it's a little too much to go over every functional GI, so I've just uh, decided to touch on these two. Functional dyspepsia, there's two subtypes. Epigastric pain syndrome. This is important to remember. You can have functional dyspepsia that there is pain that is not related to PO intake. Postprandial distress syndrome, on the other hand, is functional dyspepsia that usually starts after PO intake. 
Again, the patients usually complain of postprandial fullness, bloating, um, nausea. There may be some early satiety, which causes some minor weight gain and some pa- or weight gain, weight loss. <laughs> and some patients can complain of epigastric burning as well. Our understanding of the mechanisms behind functional dyspepsia has evolved a lot over the recent years. There's evidence that there's impaired fundic accommodation, which can explain some of the early satiety as well as the nausea in these patients. Similarly to irritable bowel syndrome, there's evidence for this uh, visceral hypersensitivity. So again, hypersensitivity to gastric distension, hypersensitivity to acid and non-acid reflux, and hypersensitivity to the gastric contents as they empty into the duodenum. And I find that explaining some of this to patients helps them feel that they're not crazy and that their doctor doesn't think they're crazy. Treatment for functional dyspepsia. So again, this is going to be a little bit similar to treating the upper gut IBS symptoms, um, establishing, again, that good relationship, establishing expectations are very um, important. Diet is going to play a role, um, advising your patients to have smaller, more frequent meals, avoiding high-fat meals, especially later in the day. Nancy may touch on the FODMAP diet um, uh, later on this afternoon. Probiotics and peppermint oil have also been shown to help with gas and bloating, and patients love taking those. Exercise, sleep hygiene, acupuncture, and treating underlying stress and anxiety is critical for the treatment for these patients. And again, as a primary care setting, I can't emphasize enough, talking to your patients about their underlying stress or anxiety and approaching that is key. So my last slide is the medicine options for the treatment of functional dyspepsia. Proton pump inhibitors have been shown in studies to be helpful, and if I think that gastric acid is playing a role, I'll try that. But I will say that, in, at least in my experience, there's very few patients that do well with just PPIs. Similarly, H. pylori, there is evidence for treating and uh, or testing and treating for that. But again, I wouldn't put all of your eggs in one basket and, and tell patients that if they have H. pylori, if you treat them, all their symptoms are going to go away. I try not to use um, domperidone or Reglan unless the patients have radiologically proven gastroparesis, again, off of their Vicodin and Percocet. Um, and in my patients who have daily or, again, severe symptoms, I like to try them on a low-dose tricyclic or an SSRI if they're up for trying a medicine. I think that it helps, again, decrease that visceral hypersensitivity. The key with the tricyclic is that you have to remember about the constipation. And even if your patient doesn't have constipation now, they may get constipation. So at the time that you give them the prescription, you also need to give them a plan of what to do if they get that constipation. Otherwise, they're going to stop taking the medicine and and never want to try it again. Boosperone has been shown to improve fundic accommodation. And for your herbal-loving patients, you can recommend Iberogast and artichoke leaf, as they have been shown in studies to improve global symptoms. And finally, don't forget about the psychological uh, therapy options. Some patients have such extreme anxiety about the postprandial pain that they're going to experience that they will get that pain before the food has even reached their stomach. And that is the type of patient where you can try all these medicines in the world, but it may not approach their underlying reason, which is this anxiety and hyperattentiveness. So that's a unique group of patients that you may want to refer to cognitive behavioral therapy to address that. Thank you very much.